All right, level two, lesson five B. I'm saying that for the sake of the video so they can, I can find out where I'm, I'm at to, to edit stuff. The value of a soul. You know, when I, when I saw that title, I just thought, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to satisfy? Yeah. How do I adequately share something like the value of a soul? Mark 8.36 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? What if you get a Tesla, Pastor Bob, <laughs> an eight-room, 22-bathroom house, right? Isn't that what some of those big houses are? They seem to have like twice as many bathrooms as they do houses. I don't, I'm trying to figure that out sometimes. Man, must have been. Man, yeah, mess this one up, move to the next one, right? The, the, the maid can't keep up. Gain the whole world. Get everything you think you need. You know, there's a lot of things we think we need that in reality, if we could just have the mind of God about something for a minute, we would discover that really are worthless. Huh? So what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Now here, this is one of the difficult things that we have as Christians to somehow convey to those that are in the world. That there's something beyond this life. Now, if, yes, we want this life to be a great life. To be in up life, right? But the purpose of that is so that we can impact others for the kingdom of God. Because there are literally thousands upon thousands of people in this city alone who don't know Jesus. If you open up the paper, which we probably don't have papers anymore, all digital, but if you glance through a Ventura paper or something, you probably would find out that, I don't know, five or six people passed away yesterday, right? At the hospital, at the house, whatever, right? And it's a good chance that many of them walked into that without knowing God. Now, according to my Bible, when that happens, they're spending eternity outside the presence of God. I read something just the other day, probably this was today. It said that there is no peace in hell because Jesus is our peace. <clears throat> right? There is no love in hell because God is love. See, God's not in hell. So if he's not there in that sense, right? There's no, there's no light in hell because Jesus is the light of the world. Again, to me, hell is not about fire and brimstone and all that stuff. It's about... Again, I, I don't know if this can be when I, when I think about it. I, I got to get it more into my spirit. Somebody that never, they ignored God, whatever, whatever they decide in life, at the moment of judgment, they're going to come into the presence of God. And sometimes when we think about that picture, we think about God, you sinner, you are cast into hell, you know, and all that kind of flat, you know, kind of dramatic stuff, right? No, no. God is love. I want you to imagine. That person standing before God and experiencing the perfection of love. I mean, just washing over them. All the while recognizing all the opportunities they had to embrace that love while they were alive. Having that perfect moment and then never having it again. pretty hard. All kinds of people have had untold riches, fame, and power. They've been acclaimed, idolized, elevated, whatever. I had a gentleman in my car last night. I wondered if he was some sort of celebrity, but I didn't bother him. I was a nice guy. But I'm thinking to myself, what does it mean to be a celebrity? Because when they pass away, right? Some of you heard about... Uh, Shirley of Laverne and Shirley. Some of you guys are so young, you probably know what that is. Laverne and Shirley. Mm -hmm. Shirley passed away this week. Cindy Williams. Cindy Williams. Mm -hmm. I read some of the stuff she was talking about God because she said she was a spiritual person, but it was, some of it was just like, uh, I don't know what that's what you're saying exactly. And I hope she knew the Lord. I'm not trying to judge her. The only one that knows is her and God, right? Because mm -hmm. when they die... All of the acclaim, all of the possessions, none of it matters. 
Like Job said, I came into this world with nothing, I will leave with nothing. We depart this earthly life and face an eternal destination. Worldly life and its pleasures. This life, where we're at right now, is fleeting, right? It's just a, it's just a snap of the finger in comparison to eternity. We talk so much about victimization, oppression, opportunity, all these kind of things in, in, in the culture. You know what, again, what I think a lot of times is it doesn't really matter. Dolores... You were not standing before God before you came onto the planet and said, oh, I want to be short. Forgive me. I'm, I'm, I want to be a female. I want, to, I want to be of this race, have this kind of intellect. You didn't, you didn't have a checklist that you were going through to make choices, Right? Why am I born here and some other individual is born in Africa, for example? God places everybody where they're at and then he leads them through a life that's designed to draw them to him. Whatever we are. Whatever we are. Remember, the Bible says when we get into heaven, there's not, neither male or female. There's no marriage. All those kind of things. We're like the angels, right? This life is a preparation for the next. And we learn things from this life or, or we don't to our detriment. So our focus should be upon us, the soul, our soul, the souls of others that has eternal value. Number one, God holds the human soul in high esteem. It's very valuable to him. Obviously, if it's valuable to him, it should be valuable to us. Every soul has its origin not Oregon, origin, but however you need to spell it, in God. God recognizes the soul from the time of its conception, Psalm 139, an often quoted verse. Like, I'm not going to go into it at the moment, but just, you know, you knew me in the womb. We're made in the image of God, Genesis 2, 7. And God is seeking to reconcile humanity to himself. The Bible says that every soul belongs to God Therefore, God has the right to judge or to forgive. Ezekiel 18.4 Our souls will one day return to God. Ecclesiastes 12.7 It be belongs to God. He is the creator. We are the creation. But he still gives us what? Free choice in how we live this life here in determination of where it will go next. B. The cost of of a soul proves its worth. First of all, sin, a word that we don't like to talk maybe a lot about, separates the soul from God. And yet, God provided a way to bridge the gap that was created by sin that exists between him and humanity. What made it possible? Romans 5, 6-8, I'm going to read. For when we were still without strength, in other words, we didn't have the ability to do anything about it, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. You know, good person, we might, maybe, we might be willing to sacrifice our life. You know, I'm just going to tell you for true, for true. Again, as you get older, you do think about this stuff more. Sometimes I'm just like, what is it going to be like? When that day comes. But scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Will you sacrifice your life? Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that while we were still sinners. While we were still in opposition to his will. While we were still defying what he wanted. Christ died for us. That's how much value God puts on a soul. There's been that often quoted thing. I'm not going to say it exactly the same way everybody does, but if only one person had accepted the Lord, Jesus would have came. One person. Man was not redeemed by cheap religion. Do this, don't do that. 1 Peter 1, 18, 20 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, 
such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, the sinless Jesus. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. We're not redeemed by it. The Bible even says our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Because there's always something involved in them, human involved in them. They're not, they're not normally pure unless they're motivated and birthed by the Spirit of God itself. C, God provides a way for lost souls to come back to him, come back. He sent Jesus to be a ransom for us, for many. Jesus is the shepherd. He is willing to leave the 99 to seek out the one lost sheep, Luke 15. In fact, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one soul that repents and comes back to the Father. And again, let me, I, I want to hammer on this idea of repentance. Repentance is absolutely fundamental to a changed life. You know why some people come to church, raise their hand, get saved, and you never see them again? Because very likely they never repented. They never saw their true condition before God. Never saw their need for a Savior. They just felt all twisted up inside, and I need God. I'm not faulting what we do. But unless they have that understanding, I desperately need a Savior in my life. They won't make that step to really engage God in real relationship. And then uh, the verse is Luke 15, 10. It repents, it comes back to the Father. And I think that's so cool. If, imagine the picture for just a minute of the Father on the throne. The angels are all around him. It talks about the angels rejoicing. But you know why the angels rejoice? Because God rejoices. When a soul comes to the Lord and cries out to God and says, Come into my life, establish relationship, reconcile me to yourself, I repent, whatever, right? The reason that the angels rejoice is because the Father is rejoicing. They're responding to his emotional outburst, if you will, over this awesome miracle. The most significant miracle that it can occur. Because you know, a dead person raised to life will die again. Somebody that's blind and he sees again will die at some point. It all comes to an end. This life is just temporary. But a life that's been saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ has all eternity. That's the miracle. D, God gave heaven's fairest jewel to rescue, rescue lost humanity. The only way that there would be a pathway to heaven was for God to give the life of his only begotten son, John 3, 16. Think of this. There was nothing of more value to the father than his son, yet he gave him up for us. Think about your own children. How much, how valuable they are to you. Would you be willing to give them up? Seems, it seems incomprehensible to even thought, think about it. And yet God did. This proves our worth to God. 1 John 4, 9 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Two, Satan tries to snare every soul. Snare. A, Satan does not like to see people loving and serving God. Loving and serving. Job chapter 1. If you don't know the story of Job, Job was living up, upright. Satan comes before God. God brags about Job. And Satan says, oh, of course he's going to. You're blessing him. Well, of course, if you're living in right relationship with God, God's blessing you. Satan can't stand to see anyone in right relationship with God. He does not want people to know, to love, to serve God. His intention is to lead them away from God so that they will be contempt, condemned excuse me, to an eternity in hell. If souls were not valuable, 
he would not involve himself in our affairs. He wouldn't care. The fact that he comes after us is another, indi another indication of how valuable we are. B, no one, no one is safe from the devil's attack. He will try to get everyone he can. Right? Luke 22 says that Peter was even a target of enemies. He said, Satan has desired to, to get you, Peter. It didn't protect him. In fact, it may have even increased the enemy's attacks against him. Enemy fights those who choose to serve God. If somebody's just living life and doesn't care about God, he lots of times leaves them alone. He just lets the natural process of living in sin take its course. The enemy is a devourer. He seeks to destroy, 1 Peter 5, 8. His intention for you is destruction on every level. He doesn't want you to have health, prosperity, joy, peace, or heaven. He wants to ensnare you, 1 Peter 3, 7. He will use every subtle attack. And let me tell you something. He knows your buttons. He knows your weak spots. This doesn't mean that he's like omniscient or something. It's that he's around or his minions are, are around. And they're, it's almost like they're just taking notes. They're better note takers than we are. Taking notes on every little thing that happens. Every little, every little time you, you respond to certain stimuli, they got it recorded. They know what will drag you down, what will, will make it harder on you. And they will use all of those tricks to cause you to give up. He'll whisper lies, bring discouragement, make you feel rejected. His attack is endless. Ooh, that sounds really hard, doesn't it? C, Satan wants the lost to remain blinded to the truth. He is a great deceiver. He lies to people. Again, I may not always get as many opportunities to share with people in Uber as I'd like, but there's a lot of times when I'm listening, you, you can't do anything but hear conversations. They're just in the back seat, right? And, uh, and all of the lies and, and back and forth that they tell each other. <clears throat> I, had a, I had a gentleman in my car. There was three ladies with this guy. They come out of a bar, probably going to the next one. And he was talking about women like they were garbage or something. But three ladies, friends of his, in the back seat. And then he nudges me, right? Right? Like, I'm going to agree with him. I go, <laughs> you know what? I've been married 40 years. I would never talk to my wife the way you just talked about ladies. You're like, I'm afraid That's what I told him. Uh, huh? I said, you're, you're like, uh, I'm afraid Susan might have a little uh, speaker in my car right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she does. I she would does. never. It, it is her car right now. Yeah. I would never yeah. talk to my wife about my wife that way. Never. I've been mad at her or this or that over life, but they're not nothing. Right? But he deceives people into thinking things in the pursuit of pleasures that they think will satisfy some ache in their life. That it never will. It never will. It puts a veil over their eyes. He wants them blind so they won't come to know Christ who will bring them a saving knowledge of the truth. And until that veil is removed, they cannot see Christ or their need for him. And that's really the, the, the central point is helping people understand, I need Jesus. Yeah. Some people will say about Christians, oh, they're, they're weak because they need that stuff. No, we all need it. We're only smart enough, if you want to put it that way, to recognize it. Otherwise, you're just lying to yourself that you don't need it. <clears throat> Number three, Christ knew the value of a soul and willingly became a ransom for us. A ransom. Hallelujah. A, Jesus knew the price that had to be paid. I'm still overwhelmed sometimes to think of the idea. And, and, and how, how long before did Jesus know what the end of the story was going to be? How long before? When he was 10, 12, 15? When did, he, when did it all come together, as it were? You know? When he first began to understand things, that he suddenly realized, I mean, what, what? When he's in the garden, he knows what's going to happen. 
God, if there's any other way that this can be done, but not my will, but yours, right? He knew the price. He knew the price. He wrestled with it, and yet he willing, understand, Jesus gladly in the spirit, not in the flesh, right? Now, I'm not saying he's in the flesh, but in the spirit, he gladly gave himself up for us. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And when I, when I read that verse, oftentimes I look at it, you know what I see? I almost look at Jesus, he's looking at the cross, and think of it as like almost like being um, like a glass. You can see through it. I, I envision Jesus looking at the cross he sees through it. You know what he sees on the other side? You and I. If I do this, if I do this, Paul can have a relationship with me and the Father. I'll do it. See how? See what I'm saying? For the joy. Not the, the joy of dying on the cross, but for what it would accomplish. He was willing. B, I like this one, the way they put it here. He did not suffer and die just to save junk. You're not junk. You're not worthless. Barabbas was a one who, who was set free instead of Jesus. And Barabbas means a father's son. A father's son. He was a notorious criminal. He deserved death. If it hadn't been for Jesus, he probably would have never been set free. This is the picture of divine grace. The upright as a ransom for the transgressor. Jesus as a substitute for Barabbas. And we are all Barabbas. We all deserve death for sin, but Jesus gave his life that we would be free. This is the value that God, Jesus puts on us, our souls. C, he willingly paid the awful price for our souls. In, in Isaiah 53, it's a very brutal description of Jesus' death, his treatment. The Bible says, I don't know if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ. You probably, if you've been in church long enough, you've probably watched it somewhere along the way. And I appreciated the movie because it took things to another level as far as depicting the brutality of what really happened. Can I, but I, can I tell you something? It was even more brutal than that. The Bible says he was hardly recognizable as a human being. He was despised for us, rejected for us, afflicted for us, pierced for us, crushed for us. No one, absolutely no one, and need, not even the enemy, should ever be able to persuade you that you don't matter because you do. And now we have the facts of, to prove it. You have the facts to prove it. You know, I, I know all of us in life, we have a rough period, something happens. Like I said, last week I had my, my car wreck, and it's kind of thrown us into a little bit of a loop a bit, but we're, we're doing all right. But stuff like that can happen. And suddenly you're just feeling kind of down and, you know, up in chaos a little bit. And the enemy will come in and he'll say, and God must not really care about you. Your life just isn't of any value to him. Why would he let that happen? That's what the world says, right? If God is so good, why does he let the bad stuff happen? Huh? And they don't recognize that God has a bigger picture going on. We don't know everything that's happening. We don't know all the details. But God sent his son to die a horrible death in your place. Jesus willingly surrendered his place in heaven to become the sacrificial lamb for you. That's the proof you, need. you needed and now you have it. So that when you get in that moment, when you start getting down, you start questioning everything, you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. So this is how do you defeat the devil? You remind him of the word. You remind him of truth. While I was... An enemy, Jesus died for me. So I am valuable to God. That's how you defeat the enemy. Recognize what is it of him. Get in your word, know what truth is, so that when the lie comes, you can recognize it. 
The only truly valuable possession any of us have is our soul. We take nothing else with us when we depart this life. It is the only thing we have that has eternal value. Both God and Satan know the value of a soul. But guess what? Remember that, that, that election thing I showed you guys that one time? God's voting for you. Satan's voting against you. Who has the deciding vote? You do. We determine its eternal destination. The soul is so valuable that God gave his only son, Jesus, to reconcile lost sinners to himself. That fact alone is enough to stop any argument against the worth of a human being. We are precious. We are valuable. We are cherished by God. And he wants us to spend eternity in heaven with him. That's how much we mean to him. But not just us. That's how much every single person on the planet means to him. There's not one person. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's the key. Repentance, again, is an acknowledgement. That's what the Bible says, that if you confess your sins, he is faithful. You have to, you know, when I do something wrong, if I play around with it and I pretend like it's not, you know, well, it was a reason for it, or this is why I make all kinds of excuses, I'm not going to change. It's when I, that was off. That was wrong. That was sin. That was not of God. And I acknowledge it to God. I confess it to God. I don't play around with it. That's when I experience God's forgiveness. That's when I experience God's transformation in my life. So that's kind of why it's important. You have to help people to understand you do need God. You do need a Savior. But here... God's not making it difficult. It's a free gift. He offers it freely. He paid the price. All you have to do is receive it. And it's our job as believers. Why is the world sometimes the way it is? And why are people, you know why? Let's just be real. Lots of times it's because the church, we're still not in the game like we're supposed to be. And I don't mean to put that as a heavy burden on you. I, I, what I'm trying to say is, we got to figure it out. Yeah. We got to figure out how do I make an impact? How do I bridge the gap? How do we, we create relationships? Pastor Donnie was telling me that earlier. We create relationships, yes. Sometimes we don't have time to create relationships. Sometimes we say, God, help me to be that message that speaks to people. Help me to, 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 to lead me in by the Spirit so that I know what to say to somebody because you know that they're ready at that moment. And I would have a clue. But you know. Help me to figure it out, God, so I can start, right? This is not to put pressure. This is to challenge us. Okay, God, this is what I'm called to. This is my purpose on this planet now as a believer is to somehow, by whatever means possible, what did Paul say? I'm a Jew to the Jews. I'm a Greek to the Greeks. I'm a this, you know, he's whatever it needs to be to reach some. Not everybody's going to accept it, but we need, to, we need to reach more than we're reaching because some might listen. Amen? And they're valuable, as we've already learned.